where shall I go to buy myself some stuff? I could go to one of the 43 million supermarkets which are open 24 hours a day for my convenience. Or should I go downtown to the department stores, of which there are many? Perhaps I should pop up the high street to my local shops. Or even better, go round to the corner shop. Perhaps I could get into my car and pop out to an out-of-town shopping centre. Or even better, a retail park. Now that would be exciting. A retail park. How exciting. <laughs> or maybe I could stay at home and do some internet shopping. Or I could do what people have been doing since time immemorial. I could go to the market to do my shopping. <laughs> This is Bury Market in Greater Manchester, which has existed since the year dot and has recently, well, in 2006, been voted by somebody or other the best market in Britain. They're always calling it world famous, which seems like pushing it a bit. I don't suppose they talk about it much in Papua New Guinea. But it's a great market which sells lots of things. 50,000 different lines, apparently. And it's extraordinarily friendly and really cheap, too. So no surprise, then, that this ancient form of shopping, as old as our towns themselves, is still alive and kicking in the 21st century. Especially when the stallholders go to such lengths to put you at your ease. Led by What it's like to be loved by you. This is Massam in North Yorkshire, which is a market town. And that means that at some point in its history, in this case about 800 years ago, it was given permission by the king to hold a weekly market or markets. And I'm just coming now into its marketplace. I think it's supposed to be the largest in North Yorkshire. And of course, as we all know, everything's bigger and better in Yorkshire anyway. So it's probably one of the biggest in the universe. Not only does it have size to give it a certain grandeur, it's also made special by a number of really quite nice buildings. They're not posh, apart from the church, which is fabulous. I suppose the 18th century hotel is the grandest individual building. And the town hall's quite nice. But in the main, the square is just lined with nice, unpretentious 18th and 19th century houses. This one's my favourite, a little house for little people. But they're all a bit like this. Local stone and vaguely Georgianish windows. Some of them have been converted into shops, but it's all utterly unspoilt and totally charming. It's typical of marketplaces to be a bit special architecturally like this. And it's not really surprising either, because this is the biggest space in the town, and you'd expect people to show off a bit in it. But there's another and quite different way in which Massam's marketplace is typical of all the others, and that is that for much of the week it's a mildly disappointing space. <gasps> what a shocking thing to say, but it's true. For most of the week it's mainly a car park during the day. It can get quite irritating, with cars circling around looking for places to stop. And the cars undoubtedly spoil the view of the buildings. It's a big space to fill too, and it can sometimes feel a bit desolate. In the evenings and at night it can get even worse. Silence and emptiness, and a few tiddly kids reeling from pub to pub, or hanging around outside the chip shop. Ooh, the chip shop. Mm. 
To be honest, I'm being very unfair because Massam's Marketplace is a really nice place, but the point that I'm making remains true. In most market towns, for most of the week, the marketplace can seem a bit bleak and empty, and it'll have been like that for all of the hundreds of years of its history. Only on market days do things start to change. Only on market days does this place really come to life. <music> This is a ritual that has gone on twice a week here at Massam for hundreds of years. It's gone on on a Wednesday and a Saturday morning, in fact, since 1393, when King Henry IV granted the town the right to hold its twice-weekly market. Massam, like so many market towns, lies at the centre of a huge country district, and country people have always taken the opportunity of a Saturday market to come to town, to buy and to sell, of course. In the days before permanent shops, markets were the only source of provisions that people had, and they're still hugely important today. But people have always also come to see and be seen, to chat and to have a day out. And then it's over. Everybody goes back to the farms and villages. There's a bit of sweeping up and then the marketplace is back where it always is for the rest of the week. It becomes a car park again. At the heart of the marketplace is the Market Cross. All marketplaces had market crosses and the reason for that was the towns depended entirely upon trade to survive. So it was very important to have the church's blessing on the marketplace. It was like praying that business would be good. So that's why they had a Market Cross. Original market crosses are pretty rare nowadays, but this one still looks largely medieval to me. Lovely and worn and simple. Masson's Cross is a survivor of those medieval days, but for many towns throughout the north, the original market crosses were later altered or replaced. This is Carlisle Marketplace, which has got one of my favourite market crosses. I was brought up here. I mean, not literally. I didn't sleep on these steps, but I used to lurk on them when I was a teenager after school in the futile hope that some girl from the high school would be attracted by my manly stance. But as they never were, I had plenty of time to notice the cross. And I noticed, first of all, that it isn't a cross at all, even though it's called one. It's called Carlisle Market Cross. It's been the heart of Carlisle Marketplace since 1682, and it almost certainly replaced an earlier one which would have been destroyed in Puritan times, when crosses suggested Roman Catholics who weren't approved of at all in those days. Crosses were thought of as naughty papist things and had to be got rid of. So what we've got instead of religious symbols are symbols of civic pride. There's a lion, of course, and it's resting its foot upon an old, important Carlisle book called the Dormant Book, which contained all the corporations, ancient charters and things. And there's a sundial to keep the populace up to speed on those three days a year when it's actually sunny in Carlisle. I do but jest. I think it's four days, actually. And the whole thing is resting on a classical column, an ionic column, which was quite a modern thing to do in 1682. So there you are. It's nice round here, isn't it? Nice and strolly and drifty. It's got a sense of place. When I was a teenager posing hopefully on those steps, this had stopped being a proper marketplace and had become a pretty scabby place, to be honest. It had descended to being a sort of truncated traffic island surrounded by bus stops and unnecessarily wide roads. There were hideous railings to keep you off the roads and really ugly concrete lamp standards. I remember a programme by one of my television heroes, architectural writer and critic called Ian Nairn, and he came to Carlisle and he absolutely savaged the place. He showed some nice bits, the Market Cross and the Town Hall and this nice little area behind the Town Hall, but then he went on to show the grotty bits and he described it as a town that had lost its way.
I was really angry. I think the whole place was. But you know, he was right. He got Carlisle banged to rights. But as a result, the council did something about it. They made it nice. I'm in Preston at the moment, Preston Marketplace, which, as you can see, is a bit like Carlisle's, but only in the sense that it stopped being a proper marketplace and become the posh centre of the town, positively dripping with spiffing buildings and civic pride. So, pretty nice marketplace, but um, not a lot of markets. But you can't keep a good market down, so when the original marketplace got usurped by new functions, Preston provided a new one in its place. Or to put it another way, a new two in its place, because there's actually a general market and a fish market side by side. It is, as you can see, a covered market, and it's very Victorian. A characteristic blend of fancy ironwork and glass, open-sided to keep the produce cool, one can only assume, in the baking heat of a North Lancashire winter. I really like these buildings. I don't quite know why. They're fancy, but they're ordinary at the same time. They're very Victorian, and they're very English. They were designed between 1870 and 75 by three men. There was Mr Parks, Mr Sykes, and somehow appropriately in a market, there was Mr Garlic. This, of course, is a fixed market and a covered market, something that we haven't seen so far in this programme, because for a long time, such things were rather rare in England. Thousands of towns in continental Europe have got ancient medieval covered markets. You'd have been very interested in them, actually, but uh, for some reason, best known to themselves, my television masters have declined my request to go and film them for you, so you're going to have to make do with my holiday snaps. This one here is the Market Hall, or Les Halles, at Villereal in central France, where I often go for my hauls. It's a wonderful 13th century timber structure, and it's still used a couple of times a week for markets, as you can see. In England, I don't know why, things like that, old covered markets, are really rare. You'd think it would be the other way around, wouldn't you, given the fact that it rains here so much and it's so much colder than it is in southern France. But in the main, in England, covered markets are a thing of the 19th century. I'm in one of the first in England. It's not the actual first. There's an older one in Liverpool, but that's been demolished. And there's still an older one in Stockton, but that's in a state of flux at the moment. So this is one of the first, and it was certainly the largest in the world for a while after it was built. It was designed by an architect called John Dobson, and it's in Newcastle. It's called the Granger Market. Why don't you pop off and have a look at it while I get on with my healthy snack? From the outside, it's grandly classical, typical of the time that it was built, but good, very good. It's part of the splendid new classical planned town that Newcastle was developing at that time. Inside, it's got two sections. This bit was originally the fruit and veg market, and it's rather like lots of other market halls, which were to spring up all over the north in the course of the next 50 odd years. There are hundreds of market halls like this, big rooms with big iron and glass roofs, like the roofs of stations. Dobson originally designed this with a wooden roof, 318 feet long and 57 feet wide, one of the largest wooden roofs ever made. It was only turned into iron later. But the other part of the Granger market is quite different to most of the markets. 
It's got a grid of narrow aisles, each with its own roof and its own strip of clear story windows to provide natural light. Markets this shape are quite rare. Can I think of another one in the north? I cannot. I bet one of you will, though, just to show me up. A market like this, which is covered, is warmer than an outdoor market, obviously, and, of course, it's got permanent stalls, so there was no setting up early in the morning, and punters could come here at any time of the week and buy just what they wanted. That had never happened before, certainly not for ordinary people. And, of course, it had virtually everything anybody could possibly want to buy, and it still has. The butchers all seem very real. Naked meat and mighty cleavers and well-worn chopping blocks. Proper sweet shops, proper ones, not just pre-wrapped. It was artificially lit from the start. Now there's one of the original gas fittings. And the world's oldest M&S. Now that does seem a bit special. The Weighhouse. My father-in-law used to come down here regularly. Well, all of the time to get weighed. He used to try to persuade me to come down. <laughs> no way. Do you think I should? Yeah. Never. That's wrong. That's a lie. It must have been that breakfast. <gasps> Oh, I'm never going to eat again. Oh, Lord, who dare me? Well, perhaps just one tiny little snack won't hurt, eh? <laughs> Indoor markets like this were like the beginning of the shopping revolution that we've seen ever since. Shopping malls are the descendant of this, and supermarkets, department stores too. This is like an early version of all of the shopping experiences that we take for granted today. So far, I've sort of divided markets into two different types. Traditional outdoor ones, as beloved by medieval chaps, and indoor ones, as developed in Victorian times. But many markets, and Bury, where I started this program, is a good example, combine the two. It's got hundreds of outdoor stalls, temporary ones and fixed ones, and there are hundreds more indoor stalls in a whole range of indoor market halls. It is, in fact, huge. It's not old, well, not in its present form. There have been markets here since the beginning of time, but the present buildings are recent, 1990s onwards. Now fantastic as architecture, but nice enough. Pleasantly contemporary. There's plenty of shelter for the stall holders and plenty of light and comfort for the shoppers. And, of course, there is an extraordinary range of stuff. Some of it is just what you'd expect at any market since the beginning of time. Local stuff, meat and veg in terrific array. And there are also local specialities. This place is famous for black pudding, for example. Now, at this point, a better presenter would eat this and show you how delicious it is, but sadly, I'm not from Bury, and I'm not a better presenter either. I'm just little John, who's always been a bit frightened of black puddings. Clearly, some people still love them, though, but isn't it lovely to see something so local and so traditional still so popular? But what's also exciting is the way that markets have expanded beyond their traditional boundaries and adapted to reflect the new world we live in, the multicultural, multi-traveled life we now lead. So here, there's food and goods from all over the world. You can eat local sausages if you want. Or you can be a sophisticated international gourmet like me. The choice is yours in today's market world, how far they've come, especially Bury, which is still obviously extremely vibrant. 
But in today's modern world of shopping, do markets as a whole still stand a chance? Shopping has become a national pastime and the whole world has become our marketplace. Who can tell where any of the goods in all of these shop windows came from? What sort of conditions were they made in? How far have these things travelled? Oh, we've come an extremely long way from the beginnings of markets when a few bits and pieces were carried into the marketplace from the neighbouring farms. We've come, uh, well, actually, we've come full circle because this is a farmer's market, one of thousands and thousands that take place in Britain nowadays. Nothing on these stalls travelled more than a few miles to get here. I think 70 miles is the absolute limit. You know where everything came from and what's in it and who made it. You look at all of this stuff and you feel confident that the jam was made by extremely happy cows somewhere close to you and that the chickens presumably had more than a postage stamp to live on and that the pies didn't come from some industrial hellhole in Nastyville. The farmer's market movement is obviously something which has grown out of the revulsion about lots of things that have gone wrong with the way that we make and sell things. And it's not just a tiny movement either. I wrote these words actually on the 9th of January, which was the very day that the government announced the end of battery chicken production, which I suspect is something that the people behind these stalls would have wanted for a very long time. You see, this is like a medieval market. And what an extraordinary thing it is to discover that when you're looking for the future, what you actually discover is the past.